We are so glad that you're here with us this morning to worship with us. Would you stand with us this morning? Let's worship him. Lift your voices. Days of Elijah
seated. Would you watch this video about a ministry that's kicking off this week? Awesome. That is coming up very soon this week. Well, good morning. My name is Ben. I'm the youth pastor here at Finley First Church of the Nazarene, and we're so glad that you have joined us for worship today. If you are a first-time guest with us, number one, we're so glad that you're here. And two, if you would take out your phone and text the word CONNECT, to 419-422-8660. This is our online connect card. Just fill that out, give us just a little bit of information, and we would love to connect with you at some point this week, get to know you a little better, and get you plugged into the ministries here at our church. Well, coming up this week, in fact, even today, is Vacation Bible Adventure. Today is the pickup parade from two o'clock to four o'clock. It's going to be awesome. Why? Because there are t-shirts, there is Kona ice, there is fun, there's a sprinkler thingy with the water and stuff and things, and it's just gonna be awesome, and you are not gonna want to miss out on that. It's a pickup parade, so you'll be able to pick up all the information and all the supplies needed for this week. V VBA is gonna look just a little bit different, but it doesn't have to be different. You're gonna do this all in the comfort of your own home. Invite your neighbors, invite your friends. It's gonna be fantastic. So that is today from two o'clock to four o'clock. Also with that, next week is VBA Fun Day Sunday. And so first service will be like normal in here, but in second service, we will be outside on the lawn um, during that 1045 service. So bring a lawn chair and have a great time. Oh, I'll say it one more time. So in first service, Right, where are you gonna be? Here. Here. And for second service, where are you gonna be? Out there, perfect. You know it, you know it, awesome. And this is more for all the people that are watching us right now at the 1045 service. If you would text the word CHECK to 419-422-8660, this just allows us to know who is watching our service this morning. So would you stand with me? I'd love to pray with you as we continue on in worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life and breath that you fill our lungs to be able to praise you and sing about how you reign in this world. You have created the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the planets, and you call them all by name. What's even more impressive is that you know us by name. You know the very number of hairs on our very head. You love us, and we pray that you continue to, to draw near to us in this service as we continue to worship. God, we thank you for, for all the ways that you've provided for our needs. Um, God, we, we know that this, this coronavirus outbreak has um, caused us to question a lot of things, but it does not question you. It does not question your authority and how you move and how you live and how you operate. We don't know what this coronavirus is or what it does or anything, but we do know that you are still on the throne. You are in ultimate control, and we put our faith and our trust in you. We, we don't put it um, in, in doctors and scientists. We don't put it in a political party. We don't find it anywhere else but we find our hope and our trust in you. And I pray that you will heal us, heal our nation, heal our land. I pray that you will deliver us, deliver us from evil. God, I pray that you will bind the enemy right now. Give him no, no foothold into this place. Give him no foothold into our families, into our nation. I pray that you will just shun him and keep him silent. There's no room for him here. We do not welcome him here. We only welcome you and your presence in this place. I pray that you continue to, to show us and provide us your love and your peace and your comfort. I pray that you will be with those who can't be here today, whether 
they're having physical uh, issues or, or they're not feeling well, God, I pray that you will be with them right now. Lay your hand upon them. May God be with all of our young families who are preparing right now to, to come this afternoon. I pray that you will be with the VBA team as they um, make preparations and get ready and all the, the time and energy that they've spent this, this week. We know that their, their work is not done in vain, but it's, it's for your glory and for your benefit. And throughout this week, even if just one, one child comes to know you, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. And we lay all these things down at the foot of the cross. I pray that you would be with Pastor Mike as he comes and brings the message here in a few moments. We look to your word for truth. We don't find it anywhere else but your, but your word and your word alone. I pray that it, his words will not fall on deaf ears and I pray that it will transform us from the inside out so that we will go into the world and share the gospel, share the good news with those who need to hear it. And we won't fail to give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but only trust in Jesus name Christ alone strong weak made strong in the same
good to see everybody here today. And, um, you know, when you're out and about and you see things that are going on in the world, um, I guess for me, along with you probably, you just come to the point where there's just a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, um, a lot of things that are going on that uh, you just like, I don't know, you know, when you try to weigh in on it and I want to be a positive impact and I don't want to be under the weight of it. And so I want to be a part of a change that God wants to do. You know, that during times like this, um, there are things that are going to try to rise up. Organizations are going to try to rise up and be a voice. Uh, they're going to try to distract you as a follower of Jesus Christ. They're going to try to make things issues that should not be issues. And I believe that God is calling the church to rise up. I believe that God is calling us as followers of Jesus Christ to be a voice into this world. And, uh, and so I want to continue to look at the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to go all the way to verse 3 today and, uh, of chapter 1 and continue to look at this uh, beautiful book where Jesus is pouring into the disciples here at the beginning before he has ascended into heaven at the right hand of the Father. And I just want to kind of focus in on a word that is in that verse 3. But uh, I want to kind of set it up here as we look at this. Again, the church um, needs to rise up. We need to be a voice uh, instead of just watching things unfold. Uh, we need to be a part of God speaking into our world. So, so here at the beginning, the person of Jesus is central, uh, which is all the way through the Bible, but it's a central part in the resurrection. And this is after the resurrection. I want to say here at the beginning, this is, this is not a philosophy of eternal life or a presentation about theology of life after death. That's not what this is. That's not what Jesus is wanting you to do. That's not what Luke's intention of putting this in here is. Luke is showing what took place at the end of Jesus' time here on earth before his ascension. Jesus isn't something that was a part of the past only or, or a part of the present where he was there, and then all of a sudden he's ascended and poof, he's gone. It's not one of those things to where he's not actively involved in our life right now because he is here present with us in our world. He's everywhere through the Holy Spirit. He's pouring into people. And he's not just something of the past. He's not just something of the future, but he's something that's alive and functioning and here and now, right now. Just like he was in these gospel accounts. He is actively moving. We see him at work even now through the Holy Spirit. Christianity is not the acknowledgement of a creed or a religious practice. Although some will treat it like that. It will not stop people from coming to church every Sunday, marking off their religious to-do list, and go on their merry way all week long, and then next Sunday repeat the same thing, check off their box the next thing, and just continue to go on. That will continue to happen, but it's more than that. Christianity is a personal embrace of a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a relationship with a living God that is living amongst us. It's experiencing an intimate relationship with him. Um, do you know him that way? Are, are you experiencing this vibrant relationship that Jesus has for you? Are you experiencing it every day? Has the spirit of Christ indwelt you? And in Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. The dividing line it's very simple. Between a Christian and a non-Christian is the person of Jesus Christ. That's the dividing line. If you have him, then you are living in the kingdom of God. He is the sum total of all things. Jesus is the answer that our culture is looking for. But there's so much darkness around that it's breeding more darkness and people can't see the obvious. And he's called the church to bring out the obvious, to bring out that Jesus is the reason and Jesus is the answer that the, that the culture is looking for. In Luke's summary of, of, of this former account of the Gospel of Luke, 
He focuses on the person of Christ. It's an account of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. It is a different kind of doing, though, than what we want to talk about. <clears throat> it is not self-initiated, but it is always spirit-initiated. This flows from the divine activity of God. We've looked at it a few weeks ago. We talked about the divine activity of God that is actively involved around us and in and through us. Jesus always gave God the glory because it was the Father's action through him. And now he's preparing the disciples to be that kind of conduit into this world that we live in and use it to glorify God. Can I tell you that in this COVID-19 world that we live in right now, where things are changing all around us, God has never changed. God is still the same. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm writing a report uh, this week um, for our district. I'm our Sunday School Discipleship Ministries International Director, and, and I have to give a report every year. In a couple weeks at District Assembly at our campgrounds of St. Mary's, I'm going to be giving a report on discipleship and what's been going on. And, and I'm trying to formulate my mind right now as I speak, and, and a part of my report is going to be a, a pre-COVID-19 look and a post-COVID-19 look. But can I tell you that that may be changing some of the things that we do, but it doesn't change the things that God is doing. We cannot change the mission that we have as a church, as a body of people. That never changes. It's the same. God's truth is the same. So let's jump into this book and see what God has to say to us here today. In Luke chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In my former book, Theophilus, <clears throat> I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And then he reminds us in this next verse, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now, if you can remember, maybe most of you can't, um, but in this particular passage in the Greek, the way it really says is until the day, and then it takes, he was taken up to heaven at the very end. So it says really in this sense, until the day after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen, he was taken up to heaven. I think that's important because the focus is on the ascension. The focus is on the action of the Father, that the Father reached down and brought Jesus to himself. It wasn't one of those things where, okay, you're Jesus, you're the Son of God, so therefore you're going to go. No, the Father reached down, because you've got to remember we're going to look at it in this message is that Jesus became sin for us. He was sin. He was divided from God. At one point, after he died on the cross, he experienced all of that. When Jesus chose the disciples, where it talks about here, the apostles he had chosen. He could have just stopped with the apostles, but he's putting a, a double focus on the apostles that he has chosen. Do you know how he chose the disciples? It wasn't because of their giftedness. It wasn't because, well, they're really good at this. Ooh, uh, you got some gifts that I really need. I want to I pick you, Peter. Oh, Matthew, uh, you know, I know you're a tax collector now, but I think, you know, you're pretty organized, and I think I'll choose you to be one of my disciples because I need someone to organize there. Judas, uh, yeah, I'll choose you because you're a good bookkeeper, or we thought he was, you know. But, but no, that isn't why he chose them. He chose those particular disciples because he went away with the Father and prayed. All night long he prayed. And in essence, the Father chose the disciples. He told Jesus exactly who to choose. Every command Jesus gave before the resurrection and at the ascension was given to him through the Holy Spirit by the Father. He found his total source in the Father. Everything in the Holy Spirit delivered it to the Son. This new kind of doing focuses on the activity of God, activity of God, the divine activity of God through Jesus. And now, as Jesus hands it off to his disciples through us, now we get to our verse we're going to look at, verse 3. 
It says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So Luke focuses this section right here on the person of Jesus Christ. Again, that's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. But I think that when he uses this double focus on he presented himself, he's reminding us again that this is a real person, and his name is Jesus, and he walks among the disciples for 40 days. He was not a vision in the distance. They did not imagine him. He spoke to them about things pertaining the kingdom of God. And so there's a double emphasis on him. The same Jesus that walked with them for three years is this same Jesus that they're not imagining. They can touch, they can see the nail-scarred hands. This same Jesus is with them for the next 40 days. And boy, does he have something to say. And I believe he has something to say to us too today. I believe he wants us to rise up and be the voice of God. I believe that he wants us to get serious about our relationship with him by being serious in this world. I think there may be this emphasis to remind us that Jesus is the same that he was before the resurrection and after the resurrection in his attitude and emotive. He, it wasn't, I'm done with the first part, okay? I, I, before the resurrection and to, to the cross, I taught you all these things for three years. Now I'm going to teach you something different. No, it was the same. It was the same. There were no new sets of lessons. He continued to pour out his life for others like he did before the resurrection. When he taught the disciples before the resurrection, he's still teaching them the same thing. He has the same goal and the same purpose. And it's all found, I believe, this morning in the word that we read in verse 3, in presenting himself. Presented. I think it's in that word. I think Luke is conveying a con concept far more than simply saying he came to show himself. You see, I mean, that would work. Jesus did more... The, the, you know, he, he showed himself. He died, they left, they buried him, and then he appears. And so Jesus would naturally go around and show himself and say, hey, listen, I'm alive, and seeing him in body form. But it was more than showing his body and that he's alive. He was physically raised from the dead, and he is alive. But he wanted to do more than just convince the disciples that he was physically alive. Luke could have used another Greek word to describe what he was doing. It's found in Luke 17, 14, where in there we're seeing these lepers that were healed. And, and uh, when he saw them, he said, go and show yourself to the priest. And they went and they were cleansed. That could have been the word that he used to show himself the disciples, but that isn't the word that he used. The word that he used for presented shows us three things. The first thing is servanthood. At the heart of the word is the idea of service. It implies dignity and also dependence. We read about the angels, how they presented themselves in such a manner in Job chapter 1, verse 6. It says, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Another place in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's talking about the position of the priests and the Levites, and at that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry out the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister and pronounce blessings in his name as they still do today. And so there's this presentation, presenting, and so Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering for the purpose of of service. There is never a tone of, I told you so. There is never this tone, uh, this resurrection appearance, appearance where there's a hint of judgment or condemnation in any of his conversations. He didn't come around to Peter and say, hey, listen, if you would have just believed, you wouldn't have denied me three times. He didn't even bring that up. 
He'd already forgiven him for it. He released him. He's now being free in Christ. And there is not any condemnation or judgment. His purpose has not changed. He was a servant before, and he will be a servant after the resurrection. He came to serve. Many times in our songs, we indicate that when Jesus returns a second time, he will not be like he was the first time that he came. He came the first time as a lowly baby in a manger, but he will return as king of glory. He came to die on the cross the first time, but when he returns the second time, he will be a conqueror. And though these statements of his second coming are true, and it's coming near, and we are preparing for that, we must look closely at the attitude and the motive of Jesus. He's not changed inwardly. He still has the same mission. The circumstances may have changed, but he does not need to die again for the sins of the world. But the burning of his heart is his love for mankind, is his love for you and I, is his love for the lost, and his purpose is the cross. He came the first time to pour out his life. He will come again to pour out his life a second time. But he doesn't do it through dying on the cross. He does it to redeem the world to himself. Redemption was the purpose of the first coming. And let me tell you, church, redemption is the second purpose for him coming the second time. He has not changed. Do you remember the story of the two brothers in Matthew who came to him wanting to be on his right and his left at the coming kingdom? I think it's interesting, when I look at that story, I'm always amazed at that. They brought their mother with them, you know the story. Um, Mommy's got to come and speak for us, you know. People are still doing that today. Mom's got to stand up for me. Not only was she their mother, but she was the sister of Jesus' mother. And it came with them. They wanted to use her influence to swing theirs to, to favor them. Could it be that they were thinking, well, you know, during Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine, um, his mother convinced him, he didn't want to do it, but he, he con- she convinced him to do it anyway, and he did, and that was his first miracle. Maybe she could do it again and choose me to be on his right and his left. So when all the other disciples realized what was going down, a great dispute among them came up. Who's going to be number one in the kingdom? And Jesus gives them this great insight in verse 27 and 28 of Matthew chapter 20. Look with me. It says this. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus had a driven passion to serve. He demonstrated that for three years with the disciples, and it ended with him dying on the cross, the ultimate serving step in our place. He took your consequences. Now we see that Jesus is the same as he steps in as a servant. How can Jesus mold them into what God dreamed that they could be? How could he mold these disciples? He's only got 40 days left. How is he going to do that? So he spent these 40 days with the disciples, giving them instructions and things, the scripture says, pertaining to the kingdom of God. He was born to serve, and now he was raised to serve. Look with me in Hebrews 7.25. It says this, Therefore... He is able to save those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Do you see that? He always lives to intercede. Even now as we speak, he's interceding for us. You know what that tells me? He will do whatever it takes. He will do whatever it takes necessary to get the truth to each one of us and to those out into the world. He's going to do whatever it takes. Jesus is prepared to give whatever time it takes to bring you to a full awareness of spiritual truth about him. One focus and one desire. 
I want to set this up, but here in this message, as we go towards the latter part of it, I want to set it up that he's doing this and pouring into us so that we will go out and pour into a lost world. Because during this COVID-19 era that we're in right now, there's a lot of confusion and chaos. There, there's a lot of things that are going on that just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. And God is not the author of confusion, and he's not the author of fear. And so when anything brings up fear and chaos and confusion, you know that, that, that God is not the author of that. And so he wants to speak into us. Another part of this word, presented, is spotless, is the word and the concept of spotless. Spotless is ingrained into the fiber of the kingdom of God. If you could fully comprehend what Jesus left to come to us, you would appreciate this more and more. Jesus is there with the Father, and the Trinity is there. It's alive and active. It just didn't start when he was born, but he was alive before that. He was with us from the very beginning of time. And yet, Jesus chose to leave his glory and set it aside for us. In his first coming, Jesus embraced sin of an entire world. Think about that for a moment. He didn't just come and touch it and then run away from it and say, well, I was there and I touched on it. No, he went to the very heart of sin and he became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If it weren't for that, we would not become the righteousness of God. Jesus embraced the guilt of sin as if it were his own, as if he had committed the crime himself, committed that sin against God, as if he had committed the deeds himself. In a moment in time, Jesus experienced the full impact and the weight of our sin that was not his, but he took that from us and made it his and said, you take my righteousness instead. That's what our God has done. But this is not his condition now. This is not where he's, he's at now. He's already died on the cross, and he conquered death and hell and the grave. His death on the cross, Jesus conquered all of that. Jesus paid the penalty of our sin, and God robbed hell of the presence of his son. No touch of sin remains on Jesus now. The righteousness he lived among the disciples before his death is the same righteousness he's living after his death and resurrection. He presented himself to them again. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. I'm praying that these scriptures will come alive in that light. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we have been and are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I think it's important for us to understand Christ's righteousness in this resurrection appearance. We gotta understand that he is clean and cleared of all sin. He has conquered death in the grave. Jesus never did any sinful deed, but that is not why he is holy. I think this is important to, to, to look at. God says, be holy because I am holy. Jesus isn't holy because he was sinless. Jesus isn't holy because he made all the right choices. Jesus isn't holy because he kept all the rules. He's not holy because he abstained from evil all of his life. No, Jesus is holy because his holiness is derived from the Father. That's why he's holy. It's the Father. 
His holiness was not accomplished by his own actions. Because quite frankly, if that were the case, if Jesus is holy because he's the son of God, then you and I have a great excuse as to why we can't follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Well, I'm not Jesus. I can't do that. Come on, I'm not the son of God. I'm not able to do that. I'm not that strong and powerful. I'm not able to make the choices that he made or did not make the choices that he didn't make. All of this flowed from the divine activity of the Father within him. Jesus did not work on being disciplined in every area of his life, in everything that he said, and everything that he did. He didn't work on that and saying, I've got to be disciplined because I've got to be a good example. I've got to, be, I've got, I've got to force myself. I've got to do this. No. He lived a crucified life, and that enabled the Father to flow through him, just like the Father wants to flow through you and I. Service to others naturally flowed out of that kind of spirit and attitude. As it was between Jesus and the Father, so it is between us and Jesus. Don't miss this. Christ derived his righteousness from the Father. God constantly acted through him, through the Spirit of God. Pay close attention to this next verse. Chapter 9, verse 14. Look what it says. How much more then, it's talking to you and I, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve a living God. Do you see that? Christ offered himself without spot or wrinkle to God. And because of his offering, we have the continual redemptive process of Christ operating in our lives. We have access to that. You know what the enemy doesn't want you to know? He doesn't want you to know that you have access to that. In your identity with Christ, you have access to that. But how did he offer himself? He offered himself through the eternal spirit forever. The same spirit that is active and living here amongst us today, we have access to and offer ourselves through that. This continues to happen as Jesus presents himself to the disciples as these infallible proofs in the resurrection. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know that Jesus wants to do that in and through us what the Father was doing in and through him. He wants to do that very same thing. God presented Jesus in righteousness to serve in service to the disciples, and it's the same thing. The resource for his service came to Jesus through the Father, and now in like manner, Jesus presents us in righteousness, in his righteousness for service to a lost world to give glory to God. Colossians 1, 21 through 22. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blameless and free from accusation. You know, because of that, there is no more gap between God in us. Jesus leveled the gap. He is the filler of the gap. We are no longer alienated. We have become one with God, and Christ has presented us. As God presented Jesus to the disciples, now Jesus presents us to the world. Let me remind you, Jesus was not righteous on his own. But we derive our righteousness from Jesus just like Jesus derived his righteousness from the Father. We are no longer able or willing to live a self-centered life when we put Jesus in the center of our life. But the Spirit of Christ flows through us. Colossians 1.28. He is the one we proclaim. 
admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So what this tells me is that we are to participate in the redemptive work of Jesus in the world. This word we present is always linked with righteousness and service. I'll I tell you, an interesting uh, place in the Bible where it, it uses the word present is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. It says this, And to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You know, he's talking about the church, but he puts it in the context of how a husband ought to treat his wife. I think this is key here. Verse 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Do you know that if our husbands would treat their wives like that and present their wives to themselves like God is showing us here, our divorce rate would be going down. But unfortunately, our husbands aren't presenting their wives without spot or wrinkle anymore. They're pointing out spots and wrinkles. That's the problem. He's talking about the church, though. He's talking about us. There's a third word that comes from this word presented, and it's surrender. Now, we all know that Jesus would not have been able to do either of the previous ones, servanthood or spotlessness, without surrendering to the Father. But I think we have a wrong definition of surrender. I mean, it's not wrong, it's right, but, but I want to talk about the surrender a little different than what you're used to. A lot of times we think of surrender, of, of this sense of straining, like, oh man, I know I've got to. I don't want to, but I will. Not my will, but yours be done, Father. You want to do certain things, and, and you, you just, in your spirit, your desire is not to want to do that, so you just surrender. Okay, I know it's the right thing to do, but this surrender I'm talking about is not that kind of surrender. This surrender, if you look at it this way, that Jesus relaxed his life into the Father's hands. It was not, oh, I really don't want to do this. It was just a relaxing of his life. And in this relaxation, the Father becomes a reality and a flow that was spontaneous. You see, our role as servants of Christ is to rest in him, is to be in Christ. Not necessarily focusing on the doing. See, if you got the be in the right place, then the doing will fall out. A lot of times you want to do in order to get the be. But it's the be first. You got to be in Christ. You got to be resting and relaxing in his arms and his hands and trusting him and surrendering your life. But not the doing. That comes after. See, this picture here, Paul calls us in this same process in Romans chapter 6. Look with me in, in verses 1 through 3. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He says, By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul states what we call positional theology. And he says that we have died to sin. It's seen in the symbolism of baptism in Romans chapter 8, verse, or 6, verse 3. Therefore, we have joined Jesus in his death and resurrection, verse 8. This is our position in Christ. So how does this practically get lived out in our world today? How can I live this out as a follower of Jesus Christ? I think in verse 13, he says this, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, 
but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. There's that word present. When we present ourselves to Jesus, he can flow his resurrection life through us. Again, the enemy doesn't want you to know that. Your position in Christ, your identity in Christ, is that his resurrection power will be in the center of your life. It'll be your source. He will be your source. Righteousness then manifests itself in our redemptive service to others following the pattern of Jesus. We are following him all the way. So go back to verse 3 of chapter 1. You'll see it up on the screen. It says this, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Can I place you in there? I'll place me in there. After his suffering, during this season that we're in, we'll call it COVID-19, Jesus presented you to the world so that you could go and pour yourself out. I understand there are some things that you don't understand during this time. There are things that you don't like. You can, you can sit on one side, mask, no mask. Um, you know, I believe everything they're saying. I don't believe everything they're saying. It's just a money scheme. It's not a money scheme. It's real. Um, the cases are increasing. They're adding other things in to increase the cases. Whatever side you are in, whatever camp you're at, do you know the solution? Jesus. <laughs> Frustrated or not, Jesus. I, I got to look at myself when I go out. And wherever I am, am I on mission? Or have I chosen to just kind of set it aside for a little while? He appeared to disciples over 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. What are your conversations like? Are they about the kingdom of God? So in conclusion, I want to say this. Jesus came to the disciples in order to serve them and redeem them. He came back to them after the resurrection, just like he was leading up to the cross. His focus during the 40 days was on them, not on himself. He was washing their feet in another way. As Jesus served the disciples, he rendered righteousness and holiness to them, and he helped them to realize that it wasn't what they were doing, it was what he was, Jesus, in the center of their life, could be righteousness and holiness. They could claim holiness if they put Jesus in the center of everything, in your reactions to everybody, even the ones inside your family. He became sin for us so we could actually do this by the Spirit. He conquered sin completely, and we see righteousness in his Spirit-initiated service, and he does it again. This was all based on Jesus surrendering to the Father, and when Jesus relaxed in surrender, as he's calling us to do, the Father flowed through him in a righteous service to the disciples as he wants to flow through us to a lost world. Do you know anybody that doesn't know Jesus? Do you know anybody that's fearful during this time? so fearful they don't even want to go anywhere, so fearful that they, they fear fear itself. Can I remind you, that's not of God. God is bigger than that. Could it be that we're trying too hard and making it difficult? I'm talking about this holiness thing. Could it be that we're focusing so much on trying to do the right things to be holy that we're missing it?
Can I tell you, we have a world out there that is looking for Jesus and they're looking for answers during this COVID-19 era that we seem to be in. And Jesus, I don't know why, but he calls us to go and do the same, but to be his voice in this lost world. He wants us to be his hands and feet. Are you doing that? Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray today for you to help the church to rise up and to be the church. Forgive us for those times that we've just kind of relaxed and just kind of sit back and, and just kind of let things happen. Lord, we want to be your voice. We want to speak life and truth. We want to speak like we've never spoken before. We want you to speak through us. Lord, I don't want to take the place of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to speak conviction on people. I want to speak the truth. I want to speak the truth in love. I want to be faithful. There are things that are frustrating around, that's going around right now. There are our lies that we're, we're seeing every day. But Lord, um, I don't want to be overwhelmed by that. I want to be empowered by that. I want to make a positive impact for the kingdom of God. So do as you've always wanted to do and speak through your church. Speak through your people. And we'll not fail to give you all the glory because you are the center of all things. You are not taken back, but you are moving forward. Lord, we know that you're going to return again someday. And we want to be ready. We want to prepare as many people as we can. But I believe that you are calling the church to rise up and to be the voice and to continue to pour into us. Lord, I, th I think of 9-11 back in 2001 when there was another interruption in our world. But Lord, there's something that we all came together. And this time it just seems like that we're going apart. Would you bring us back together in the Spirit of God for such a time as this? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and respond to God's Word this morning.
You know, for the last five years, when it, we've been able to, at the end of this service, clear out all these chairs and get ready for our vacation Bible adventure here in the sanctuary with all these little feet running around, and it's packed, and I've got pictures of people, of you know, the kids singing and praising the Lord and doing activities, and it's just been a fun thing. This year, it's kind of a bittersweet thing. We're not going to be able to clear out all these chairs this year, but we're still having vacation Bible adventure. And uh, we still are able to reach out in our community through this as well. So I want you to do me a favor and pray for this week, Vacation Bible Adventure. It's going to start today between 2 and 4 with a drive through They're going to do a bunch of fun things. And we're going to be inviting all of our families to come and pick up their packets. And then this week, they got a lot of fun stuff they're going to do, be doing in their home. And then they've got a live presentation. They'll be going into the home and doing a bunch of giveaways and things. This is going to be a lot of fun for them. But one of the things that we're going to do this year is go into the community. We're going to take the church out into our homes. And I want to pray for a harvest to happen in the midst of this COVID-19, that people will see something going on and their kids will go and be a part of this awesome Vacation Bible Adventure. It's going to be a great week. Next Sunday, our first service is going to be our regular service in here. Our second service is going to be out um, on the lawn over there. Bring uh, your lawn chair, and we'll have some chairs here, but if you forget that, we'll have some for you. But, but we're going to have it out there, a service out there, and this is going to be a great culmination of Vacation Bible Adventure. But would you remember to pray for our families and our kids and all the people that join us this week? Um, we're going to have an opportunity to put these things in the book of Acts into practice and go out and pour out into this lost world as Jesus poured into the disciples, and he calls them to go out and begin the church. The church is alive and well. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have to glorify your name this week, to actually put into practice what we've been talking about. And Lord, I pray that whether it's prayer or whether we're actually putting one of those on at our home, or, or, or bringing our family along, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, I ask that you would continue to help us. Lord, call new families to be a part of this. Lord, we want to spread the love of Jesus all across our community. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity and all the people that make this happen. Lord, I pray that you go with us this day and we will not fail to give you the praise for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here with us today. You are dismissed. Shake hands with someone before you leave. Till I live.